My name is Dr. William Vasilakis, and I am a clinical psychologist. I've been one for 30 years. I work at Hocking Valley Community Hospital currently, and I love it. Um, I have taught uh, both graduate and undergraduate courses at a university in Illinois, where I am originally licensed. Um, I'm certified in uh, forensics and substance abuse, but also experienced in neuropsychology and pain management issues. I essentially have conducted a variety of testing over a 30 year period, cognitive testing, <clears throat> personality testing, um, projective testing, testing for learning disorders, disabilities, uh, personality issues. <clears throat> I've done a lot of forensic evaluations, uh, not guilty by reason of insanities. Um, I work with pain doctors to help them assess people who might abuse their pain medications and to screen them out. I also do spinal cord stimulator evaluations for them. Um, I've worked in corrections, pain clinics. I work with veterans to get them their disabilities. I work with or have worked with a variety of hospitals, uh, substance abuse recovery centers, and I work in the legal profession as a forensic psychologist. I've just written a book, which is called uh, Trials, Tribulations, and Exasperations of a Psychologist. And hopefully that book will be out next year. The topic that I wanna to present today is 55 ways to better me, realistic New Year's resolutions. Um, and I'd like to start by defining what a resolution is. A resolution by definition is a resolve or a firm decision to do or not to do something. Human behavior is purposeful and or intentional. This covers both conscious and subconscious behaviors. When we make a resolution or a resolve to do something, we say that we are determined in a purposeful sense to do something or not to do something. Again, human behavior is purposeful. Many people make New Year's resolutions, but according to Scranton University, only 12 to 19% actually keep their resolutions. Um, and usually resolutions fail by mid to late January and into February. People just do not uh, continue with their resolutions. Many people fail um, and some of the reasons for failure have to do with they see no immediate rewards, their resolve weakens, they have no support and they do not see the overall purpose to continuing with their resolution. Psychotherapist Jonathan Alport studied resolutions. And basically he came up with three main reasons for failure. One is the resolution was not specific enough as it should have been for the individual. Resolutions are worded too negatively and become overall discouraging for the individual. And as well, they are not relevant to that particular individual. For example, someone may see their friends lose weight, they may or may not be at a stage where they wanna do this, but they go along with the program to lose the weight and ultimately they fail in that. To succeed at a resolution, several factors must be in place. Timing is very important. You have to be ready to make that resolution and stick to it. The second thing is that People sometimes are in denial about their problem or if they have an issue. Other people may see that, but they themselves don't see this. We see this a lot in substance abuse and addictions where people are in denial about them having a problem uh, with alcohol or drugs. Thirdly, um, perhaps people can't get into the pros and cons and see the benefits and analysis, but overall, um, if they continue to work at it and see the benefits and analysis and do a cost um, benefits analysis of their particular issue, they actually might succeed, especially if the longer pro list is much longer than the, than the con list. Um, to affect change, a researcher named Prochaska came up with a five stage model for change that pretty much everybody, including organizations go through. The first stage to this model is called pre-contemplation. That is basically what I said earlier, 
people may see that you have a problem, but you yourself may not actually see the problem. So as a result of it, you're not really committed to it. The next stage is contemplation. You start thinking about the benefits and the payoffs and basically what, you, what this uh, resolution of this goal might do for you in the long run. So you start thinking again, a little bit more of the pros and cons. The third stage is preparation for change. That's when you start taking things a little more seriously. You look at your motivation, you look at your, your determination, you look at the purposefulness of your behavior and you take the steps necessary for change. You outline short-term and long-term goals. These goals are reasonable and um, they are realistic goals. The fourth stage is the action stage. It is where basically you decide that you have to do this and you make that plan and you stay with that plan and work the plan to resolution of that goal. Um, and the fifth stage is relapse prevention. And we see this a lot in recovery centers. Uh, again, for um, people uh, like weight loss, um, people who are doing uh, drug and alcohol recovery, we want to create a relapse prevention program so that we can see any missteps or mistakes or things that they didn't handle correctly or look at triggers more in depth to decide why we had a relapse. And then we make uh, the appropriate amendments to that so that we can get back on track. Sometimes you might even ask a supportive friend to look at your plan and that particular individual could give you better insight into what's going on and why the relapse occurred. So what you want to do essentially is, is get organized, set up a plan, find supportive people, um, do not give in to any type of pressure, especially negative peer pressure, and find the right time for you to do what you need to do. And again, failure res revolves around not making specific goals, not making doable goals, repeating past failures, and finding that many goals are overwhelming. Sometimes you do the most minimum you can, which again, doesn't support a concentrated effort. Um, there's no support. Goals can become time or financial burdens. And you are sometimes too rigid on your goals. For example, I have to be at the gym at a certain time and I have to do so many exercises and I have to count them. Um, sometimes that's a setup for failure as well, because sometimes you won't be able to do that. So there has to be some flexibility with your goals and your thinking. And again, success revolves around choosing one goal at a time, making it doable, planning your work and working your plan, planning your day out, um, be patient with, with your uh, overall self, be tolerant of yourself, get support and modify your plan with the support and also track your progress. Um, I'm gonna just um, give you an example of a personal vignette with me. Um, I never really cared for exercise. Um, although I was in relatively decent shape as I got older, uh, some of the medical problems started to hit me. I had uh, coronary artery issues. Um, several kidney stones, back pain. I, I mean, I could go on. I lost uh, partial vision in my left eye and they had to do surgery to correct that. So I had a lot of medical problems, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. The doctor basically told me that if I didn't eat healthier and if I didn't set up a resolution to basically commit myself to ongoing exercise three to four times a week, maybe an hour at best, and then involved cardio, eventually I could have a stroke or a heart attack. Well, that lifestyle change just like hit me in the face. So I decided to make a resolution as of last year and I actually stuck to my resolution. I, I'm at my projected weight um, for my height. Um, I'm in actually fairly good shape overall. Um, my blood pressure has come down, my cholesterol has come down. I exercise three to four times a week. I have a support group where I exercise with and they help me all the time. So I am very resolved to do this and, and basically stem off any potential stroke or heart attack. I think the reasoning for me in setting up realistic goals around that and actually uh, getting beyond the contemplation stage into the action stage 
was simply because my back was up against the wall and it was the motivating factor. When my doctor started to talk about heart attacks and strokes and things like that, I as a psychologist should know stress reduction and how to uh, modify those, those factors so that I don't end up medically compromised. Well, that was enough to put me in the gym. And honestly, I have been really working out very hard and I feel better. Um, like I said, all my labs are in order now. My blood pressure came down, cholesterol's good. Um, I'm doing very well because I committed to this resolution. But the particular factor that did that for me was essentially the fact that my back was up against the wall. Sometimes people need to to be at the precipice of something in their life before change happens, because we don't always gravitate toward change and change takes time, even in corporations, even in the legal system, even in the education system, medical profession and mental health profession. With that, I want to go on to the 55 ways to improve yourself. So I will start, um, and they're not in any particular order. They're basically based on behavioral change, uh, mental health, uh, uh, cognitional change, if you wanna look at it that way, ways to look at your life and make lifestyle changes. The first one is to be passionate and determined to actually proceed with a change. Um, you want to basically move forward on something that would benefit you and see the benefit of it. Again, cost benefits analysis. The second is to work out exercise like I do, eat healthier, find ways to increase your self-esteem. For example, maybe you might wanna look in the mirror, um, not to the point of any narcissism, but you wanna look um, at yourself in the mirror and at least do two positive affirmations about yourself. I like my, your hairstyle. <clears throat> um, you have pretty eye color today. You have a nice smile, whatever you're gonna go into the day with, with a happy, good attitude. Whatever positive affirmations that you can take with you, it's, it's good to maybe say two affirmations a day about yourself, okay? Um, the other thing is to stop gossiping or doing negative behaviors like hurting people behind their back. Um, don't listen to any gossip yourself. And also anybody who's a negative Nelly in your life, you sort of wanna distance yourself from them unless you can make a positive impact upon them. Um, try to give random compliments to other people. Um, be sort of, self, um, sort of like, how do I say this? Be sort of other interested, not self-interested. Don't be self-centered. Um, I do that throughout my day. I try to compliment people and praise them for good things that they've done and encourage and support them. And that goes a long way. It helps you because it lifts you up a little bit because you're giving somebody something positive that, that is genuine. And it also lifts them up and it also creates a more um, kind of a facilitative um, relationship with them. Um, reduce your phone or text time. Probably if you can increase face-to-face -face time. In this technological world, we, we work so much off computers, texting, iPods, and that's a way to distance ourselves from being human anymore and having any kind of uh, humanism. And I don't really support that. Um, do random acts of kindness. Um, like two months ago, I saw an elderly, la elderly lady, I'm sorry, trying to uh, cross the street and like a little Cub Scout that I used to be like when I was a kid, I went over and I assisted her getting across the street. And she was, she gave me a big smile. It was, it was kind of neat to see. Um, read one book a month, maybe a good book uh, that you'd like to read, maybe a good novel or maybe a book on self-esteem um, or ways to reduce stress in your life. Learn to be more spiritual. Um, you can be religious and that's wonderful, but I tend to look at myself as more spiritual in a larger sense than just organized religion. Um, like I'll go outside sometimes on, on a, a wintry night and I'll just look at the stars and I'll just take a deep breath and I'll feel like more alive. Um, learn to relax, learn to calm yourself, learn to redirect negative thinking and be more mindful. Matter of fact, there's a good book by a, a woman called Annika Rose, and she wrote a book called Mindfulness, and it's helped a lot of my patients 
learn to relax and center themselves in life. Learn yoga. Learn to check any negative thoughts and replace them with at least two positive thoughts. Uh, go someplace you've never been. Go take a nature walk. Give up on alcohol or drugs. Um, turn off your phone at night, maybe one time per week. Go volunteer. Travel with a budget. Write down every night in a journal one thing that you're grateful for. Drink more water. Exercise with a friend. Stop multitasking. The brain really wasn't set up to multitask. It usually is uh, more concise when it does one task at a time, but we tend to multitask because in the United States, we work ourselves basically to death. Um, and we don't take enough time for ourselves. Pace yourself more, take deep breaths. Don't impulse shop, think things through more. Clean your car, pay your bills. Take the, the stairs and not an elevator if you can do that. Um, play with animals if you can. Um, you know, a dog or a cat. Don't play with a raging bull. That would get you into trouble. Go to annual checkups with your MD or your dentist. Keep yourself in health, in a healthy state of mind and a healthy state of body. Be kind in social media. Don't take out any aggression or anger. And if you are anger, angry, then realize that anger is the surface emotion and underneath the emotion that pushes the anger out, which is external and what people see is some type of hurt that lies underneath. Um, with regards to, to anger, there are books on anger, understand anger better and ways to defeat anger, yoga, meditation, active relaxation, cognitively rethinking as to what is driving the anger. Learn to not hold grudges. Learn to forgive more because when we don't forgive and we hold grudges, it's like holding a hot match in our hand. Sooner or later, it'll burn us and it's better just to let it go. Try a new hobby or a new restaurant or decide that you're going to cook something new. Cook for friends. Um, start a garden. Gardening is very therapeutic. Bring a plant into your home and nurture it. Um, sanitize your personal belongings when you can, but don't overdo it. Don't overthink things. Cook things that you've always wanted to cook. And again, cook for friends if you can or family. Send cards out to people randomly if you want, people that you know or love, and just express support and encouragement. Avoid toxic people. Avoid complainers or Debbie Downers. Put yourself around supportive, like-minded people and sort of distance, distance yourself from people that you can't make an impact on positively, um, especially if they continue to be toxic to you in a way that hurts your self-esteem or hurts, hurts you as a person. Sit in your favorite recliner, uh, maybe with your pajamas on. Um, get Get a makeover if you want. Now for men, I'm not so sure about that. For women, yes, get a pedicure or a manicure. Um, uh, maybe play racquetball or golf. Get out and do something that you enjoy doing. Go to bed at a reasonable time. Make your bed every morning. Uh, get up early if, if you can do that. Do not ghost people. I see a lot of people ghosting other people and it's very cruel, it's rude, and honestly, it hurts another person. Unless that other person is a, a um, sort of um, a malfeasant personality, like a psychopath or an extreme narcissist or someone who is hurting you constantly, obsessive in a way, as much as I still do not care for ghosting, in those situations, it might be appropriate. But just to ghost a person um, for whatever reason you're coming up with is a very hurtful thing to do. Um, and it doesn't, if you need to go back to that person, it's not going to create a great relationship for you. So um, it's actually a hurtful thing in the long run, I think. Uh, try meditation. <clears throat> learn to learn rhythmic breathing, slow rhythmic breathing. Um, work on choosing to be happy. People say that happiness is not a choice. Well, actually, there's a book called Happiness is a Choice. 
Um, and I believe happiness is a choice. Any situation you can look at, even though it may be very dismal at the time, and, and I understand that people can be very sad um, at times, um, but if you can turn that around, because it takes um, less muscles to smile than it does to frown. Read The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. I read it years ago, and I thought it, it was very fruitful in, in what it taught me about how to move forward positively in life. Pay it forward where you can and stay focused on your goals in life. Smile and stay positive. Positive people who smile and have a good um, mood around them most of the time actually have a chance to reduce their stress and live longer and their immune system is not as compromised. So mental health actually can impact physical health. So I'm just saying stay as stress-free as you can and live each day like it's your last. And um, I wish everyone the best in life. I really do. Thank you very much.